Hello, good friends. This video is the third in the series on general linguistics that will amount to a course in linguistics. Today I'd like to take up with you the issue of how to define a language. What is a language? What is the subject matter of linguistics? The way I'd like to deal with this is to give you a definition that's been very helpful to me and explore with you what that means and a bit of what its implications are. I think with time perhaps you'll come to agree with me that it fits pretty well what the phenomenon of language really is. The definition comes from Ronald Lanneker. It's in his two-volume uh, work, Foundations of Cognitive Grammar. And the definition goes like this. The grammar of a language is the structured inventory of its conventional linguistic units. That won't be clear to start with, and that's because just about every noun in that definition is a technical term. So we're going to have to be dealing with those technical terms. The first one is grammar. Lanneker is using grammar in the sense that mostly linguists use, where grammar means the full set of structures that constitute the language, what the language is made out of. In other words, the grammar of a language is coextensive with and practically equivalent to the language itself, and you can take this as a definition. A language is a structured inventory of conventional linguistic units. I'm keeping it in the definition partly because Lanneker had it, of course, but also because it helps distinguish this meaning of a language from another meaning of language that we alluded to last video, which includes all the possible structures that people could say and could understand or have said and have understood. That's much bigger than the amount that's in anybody's head. And here we're heading after what's in people's heads. What is it that constitutes what they know that is the language? And so the grammar of the language is referring to that. But if it helps you to just think of it, a language is a structured inventory and so forth. Think of it that way. All right, let's start at the end. What does a unit mean? What is a unit? The way Lanneker is using it, it's a cognitive unit. It's a structure, if you'd like, a routine is maybe a better word for it, in people's minds. And a unit in your mind is something that you have learned. Something that you've learned to recognize or something that you have learned to do. In the end, they're probably the same sort of thing. So you have mastered a skill, you have learned a routine, you have, you recognize a pattern. Those are all things that might be units. In order for them to be units, they have to be established. They have to be entrenched into your brain structure semi-permanently. And how does that happen? It's always through usage. So when you hear unit, I want you to think of usage established. This is something that by experience, by usage, you have learned to do or to recognize. It is an ability that you've acquired. It's a skill that you've learned to perform. It's a habit that you've gotten into. You can activate this habit and run through the routine. That is a unit. What are some examples of units? Well, think of walking. Walking is a unit. It's a skill. It's an extremely complex skill but pretty much all of us have learned it. And it's easy for us to just think, oh, I'll walk over here, and we just do it. It can be a part of other units. We can say to ourselves, oh, I'm gonna go outside. So you go outside and don't think about the fact that walking is part of it, but it is. And we adapt it to many situations in that way. It itself includes other units within it. One of them would be balancing on your feet. That's a pretty complicated unit in itself. But how did we learn to do it? Well, we saw people doing it, and then we tried to stand up, and we kind of learned to balance it a little bit, and with time we got better and better at it, and pretty soon we could do it without hardly thinking. And then we started to try to move our feet, and this is probably, you know, when we were less than two years old for most of us, some of us less than one year old, but it took time and it took concentration at first, but after a while we do it without thinking. Those things are characteristic of linguistic units too. So language, according to Lanneker's definition, consists of units of this type. They may be, and they often are, extremely complex, but because they are established as units, we can wield them, we can bring them to mind and do them, 
quite effortlessly. It wouldn't be unreasonable at all to claim that this ability to form cognitive units is the most important characteristic of the human species that has allowed us to achieve the wonderful things that we have achieved. It's not the only one that's important, but it certainly is an important one. Units we claimed are established by usage. It's also important to realize that they're maintained by usage. It is by continuing occasionally at least to use a unit that we maintain the ability to use it whenever we need it or want it. If we stop using it for a long period of time, we start to forget. The good thing is that even if we haven't used something for years, just using it once or twice often brings back a whole lot of what we used to know about it. This propensity to be forgotten and to become dusty with disuse is part of language. The relationship between usage and unit status or establishment, entrenchment as a unit, is uh, complex and in some ways it's paradoxical. As we said, entrenchment is produced by usage. We have to begin the usage in order to entrench a unit. And often, since the structures that we establish are complex, this takes quite a while and goes through stages. Take an English word. How does a baby learn it? Well, probably first by hearing it, and hearing it time after time. And after hearing it a number of times, it becomes coalesced in the person's cognition as an acoustic unit. He recognizes it when he hears it. Then he starts babbling and moving around his mouth, and he starts to be able to produce a sound that sounds like the one that he already knows from hearing. And with time, he acquires dexterity in pronouncing that sound, and that's good. So the usage establishes the unit. But it's just as true that once the unit is beginning to be established, that facilitates the usage. The more well-established a structure is, the more likely a person is to use it, and the easier it is for the person to use it. And since it's easy, he uses it more, and since it's being used more, it gets further entrenched, and there's a cycle going on of usage producing entrenchment, which encourages further usage, which produces entrenchment. I call this the usage entrenchment cycle, and I think it's a very important thing to keep in mind when we're thinking about language. Here are two implications of it. One of them is it's perverse to try to take one of them as the be-all and end-all, and the other one as epiphenomenal. A lot of linguists have done that. Uh, some of you may know the terms competence and performance. Competence is essentially what it is that's entrenched in your mind, and performance is usage of that structure. And some linguists have claimed that performance is to be distrusted because it only reflects imperfectly what is actually in our minds. So people make mistakes when they're talking, and you can't use those mistakes to prove what are the absolute rules that actually should, should have applied in this case, but the people failed to do it. Um, that doesn't work if you really believe this uh, entrenchment usage cycle. Even erroneous usage can establish a, a new unit and change the nature of the units, and that's going on all the time, I think. A second implication of it is that frequency of use becomes very important to us because it's the most easily measurable concomitant of strong entrenchment. We can't really measure directly how things are entrenched in people's minds, but we can measure frequencies of usage. And if there's a word that you're wondering about and you look in a corpus of text and you find it 10,000 times, you can be pretty sure that word is well, well, well established, both for the speakers and the hearers. On the other hand, if you find it 10 times, it's still probably pretty well established. But if it's only there once, well, maybe it's well established, and this corpus just didn't happen to have many examples of it. But it's also possible that it was a mistake, a one-off mistake. Or it's possible that it's well established for some people, but not for most others. In other words, pay attention to how often something, a pattern that you are interested in in language shows up, because that says something about its entrenchment. The wideness of its entrenchment or the, the depth of its entrenchment in each person. You may remember that this lines up with Joe Grimes' advice from a previous video. So much for units. What about linguistic units? What does it mean for something to be linguistic? As we'll be using it in this series of videos, a unit is linguistic to the extent that it includes or is an important part of a symbol. You'll remember that a symbol is the union of a significant, often a phonological structure, with a meaning, a signified structure. 
The union of those two, the association between them, is established by usage. In other words, it's a unit, as we've defined units. And the meaning itself is a unit, and the sound itself is a unit. It's something that people have learned to do and done often enough that it can be activated as a whole. How does a child learn to say in English, cock-a-doodle-doo? By hearing it said over and over till he recognizes it, and by practicing the sound until he can say it. Cock-a-doodle-doo. And how does he learn to think of the rooster's crow? Well, he hears <coughs> the rooster crow several times, and then he hears other people refer to it. But then he realized, oh, they link it to this cock-a-doodle-doo sound. And there you have the symbol. Each part of it is a unit. So all of the linguistic structures that we'll be examining in this series of videos are units, and they are either semantic structures or components of them, or they are phonological structures or signifying structures of whatever type, or components of them, or they are symbols themselves. We talked about symbols being bipolar. It's worth mentioning that they can be easily multipolar. So that, for instance, you might have active in your mind at the same time a sound that is a signifying structure and also a spelling, a way to write the word. And those can affect each other, actually. Just realize bipolar is the simplest case. It does happen that you get multipolar structures. We'll be talking about that in terms of ambiguity and vagueness and things like that. Okay, so a language is a structured inventory of conventional linguistic units. What does conventional mean? Conventional means that something has come to be a unit not just for one person, but for a group of people. It is a social phenomenon. It has to be shared with other people. It is shared and it's known to be shared among the members of a particular social group. Now, not all conventional units are linguistic. In the Orizaba Valley, there is a particular way of making what they call melgas, of seed beds, flower, flower beds. I'm not quite sure what the translation would be into English. But they know how to do it. And they know that each other knows how to do it. And they can expect people's behavior to rotate around the idea of knowing how to do it. I don't quite know how to say that. I'm not sure that it's a meaning structure. You might have a phrase like, pense que chiva melgati how we make melgas, but basically it's non-linguistic. They're not doing it in order to communicate anything, so it's not a significant structure. It's only by accident, so to speak, that it's the meaning of a phrase, and it's not necessarily an established phrase when it is, and it's certainly not a symbol. So not all conventional units are linguistic. Also, there are possibly linguistic units that are not conventional. An author can invent a word for his own usage and never share it with anyone else, and that would be an example. Most of the time, we don't remember things very well if we just invent them, and the way that they get really well established is when there's usage back and forth between members of a social group. It is not just the brute fact that a unit is shared that is important. It's also important that it be known to be shared. It's not just that you and I happen to know the same meaning for the sound house. It's that I know you speak English, you're going to know what house means. And you know that I speak English and will recognize the connection. The result of this is that it is incoherent to think of a language without thinking of the group that that language is spoken by. There has to be a social group of some sort that shares that language. Another way to say it is that linguistics from the very start has an absolutely essential social dimension. It's also important to realize that these units need to be established as such through usage. And sometimes we're going to use the word conventionalized to emphasize that point. It's not just that these things are conventional, but they have gone through the process of conventionalization, of being established through common usage as common. Sometimes there are meanings that are common, but have not yet been established. An example might be if two of us were outside some night and a fireball streaks by overhead, it would be very natural for one of us to say to the other, Did you see that? And we would know, the other one would know exactly what was being referred to because it was common. It was prominent in both our minds. The fireball just went by. Is a fireball the meaning of that? No, that's not an established meaning of that. In the context, it can be used to refer to that, but what that means is something much more like what is prominent to you and me at this moment? 
So the identification of the fireball with the referent of the sound that is common in that usage. It's called a didactic pragmatic usage. It's not yet linguistic because it has not been conventionalized even though it is common to the two of us. And one final thing I would like to emphasize is that all three of these dimensions of what constitutes a language are gradual parameters. They're not binary. They're not plus or minus. Unit formation takes a long time, and there are some units that are just barely beginning to be established, and there are others that are so well established you just can't ignore the fact. All the gradations in between, and there are various dimensions of this establishment that is necessary. That's part of the definition of language. It's also very clear that the social dimensions, the uh, conventionality, my goodness, how many differing groups have differing sounds or differing meanings established at differing degrees. It's not a plus or minus thing. Whether a sound or a meaning or the combination of the two is established for a particular group. It's perhaps a little less clear, but it is also a gradual phenomenon whether something is linguistic at all or not. There are some parts of meanings that are so far away from the center of the meaning that you wonder, well, can I call that linguistic? Yet it might be relevant. And similarly, when it comes to sounds and other kinds of significance, and even association of the sound with the meaning is not a plus or minus cut and dried thing. The net effect of all of that is that you're not going to be able to draw a hard and fast line and say, okay, X is in the language and Y is outside of it, even though they're very close to each other along all these different parameters. There are some things that are so clearly part of a language that you can't deny them. There are other things that are so far away that you can quite reasonably say, nah, it's not important to pay attention to that. But there's a whole lot of stuff in the middle. Nevertheless, like any real definition, if you take this one seriously, it has both a positive and a negative effect. The negative effect is that if there is anything that somebody says, oh, this is part of the language, and you can plausibly say, you know what, that's not a meaning, and it's not a significant structure, and it's not a symbol, why are you saying it's part of the language? If this definition is correct, it's not. That's the negative um, effect. The positive effect is, suppose somebody says something is not part of the language, and this happens quite often, Someone would say, oh, I can predict that 100%. Well, maybe it's only 98%, but yeah, you can predict it much of the time. Does that stop it from being established as a unit? Do we only learn things that can't be predicted in any way? No, we're more likely to learn things that can be predicted to some extent, and we often do learn them. So there are many structures that are formed exactly by the rules, and people learn them anyway. An example, I think, is the word shoes that we talked about the other time. I think, yes, that is precisely the product that you would expect from the rule of plural formation in English. So what? People learn it anyway. They're very likely to have learned shoes before they learned shoe. So maybe shoe is more a back formation from shoes than shoes is a plural formation from shoe. Works either way. The, the definition says it can be part of the language. So we'll wait for another video to talk about it being an inventory and in fact a structured inventory. But this is really basic stuff of what I think a language is like. And I hope it's helpful to you also to think of a language in this way. So to recap, a language is built out of conventionalized linguistic units. And when it comes to linguisticality, but especially when it comes to unit status and when it comes to conventionality, there are gradations all over the place. It is not possible to say 100% in or 100% out. You're going to have lots of stuff on the margins that's coming or going or sort of there but not strongly there. This collection is best characterized as an inventory, but it's a structured inventory. And we'll be talking about why it's good to think of it as an inventory and how that inventory is structured in the next video. To finish up then, I present you with some vocabulary to make sure that you understand and some questions to check whether you understand it. And I'll see you when the next video comes out. It's been a pleasure.